intense versus complex labour. The context is that I have been reviewing a book by Cheng and Fu and others. It's a book about the labour theory of value called The Creation of Value by Living Labour. It focuses particularly on the role of skilled labour. I have some criticisms of Cheng's book, which will appear when the review of the book is published, but it did prompt me to produce a video on what's often called the labour reduction program problem. So I'm going to be focusing on the difference between intensity and complexity. Two ideas that are used both by Marx and by Cheng and Fu when dealing with value creation. Speaking of average labour, Marx says, in every country there's a certain average intensity of labour below which the labour for the production of a commodity requires more than the socially necessary time and therefore doesn't reckon it as labour of normal quality. Only a degree of intensity above the national average affects, in a given country, the measure of value by the mere duration of working time. But the law of value in its international application is yet more modified by the fact that on the world market more productive national labour reckons also as more intense. This is a topic on which I produced about three videos earlier because it's relatively controversial to some third worldists. However, that's not the main purpose of what I'm talking about now. Now, when Marx compares the labour of different countries, he takes the same industry, just as I did. I took the steel industry or the, the growing of grain. He takes um, the amount, compares the amount of labour that is used to produce the same product, cotton yarn in his case. In proportion as capitalist production is developed in a country, in the same proportion do the national intensity and productivity of labour there rise above the international level. An English ma ma manager of a cotton factory on, in Oldenburg declares that the working time there lasted from 5.30 a.m. to 8 p.m., really long hours, Saturdays included, and that the work people there, under English overlookers, did not supply during this time quite so much product as the English in 10 hours, but under German overlookers, they produced much less. So he's talking about the differential productivity of labour and differential intensity of labour that operated in the 19th century between England and Germany. And he puts this down to the greater parallelism of production in England. If you do things in parallel, you can do them faster and be more productive. More, there were more spindles per worker in England. He says on average there were 74 spindles per worker in England and he gives the figures down below here of the number of spindles per worker in other continental countries. Secondarily, he puts it down to the organisation of labour. Hence the remarks about Oldenburg producing less under German than under English overseers. So the English overseers were able to enforce a more intense labour than the German ones. Now let's switch from Germany in the 19th century to Russia in the, or the Ukraine in the 1930s. Stakhanov was able to raise the output of his work team to five times the norm. And he did this by better organisation. He did this by having him, a competent jackhammer operator, working at the front, whilst others did propping, um, moving the, the coal, etc. But more intense labour also, especially in a case like mining, involves more physical effort. And how much of the intensity is a matter of physically working faster, and how much 
of it is a matter of using more advanced machinery. Stakhanov was able to do this after he'd been to a technical school and was trained on, on, on the use of the jackhammer. Could he have dug 104 tons in five hours if he was working with a handpick? Almost certainly not. So, from the standpoint of exchange value creation, labour counts as more intense, either if the person works faster or if they are more productive than average due to the use of better machinery. But we have to ask, is exchange value creation something that's of concern to us in a socialist economy? Surely not. What we're concerned with is maximising useful effort, useful effect, while minimising human effort. So we should distinguish between raising production by people making, by people having to work harder from raising productivity because labour saving machinery has been employed. On a capitalist market you don't distinguish these. Both reasons for labour productivity going up have the effect of that labour counting as more intense. But in one case it's physically more intense, in the other case it isn't. And if workers control the process of material production, they're in a position to take this difference into account, this, di this distinction between the two, which is obscured in a capitalist monetary economy, is something that a workers' organised economy can take into account. Now, the other issue is that of complex versus sil simple labour. Uh, and the context, of course, is that Cheng Enfu is discussing the, all of this in the context of the Chinese economy. What Marx said about this, simple average labour, it is true, varies in character in different countries and at different times, but in a particular society it is given. Skilled labour only counts as simple labour intensified or rather as multiplied simple labour, a given quantity of skilled being considered equal to a greater quantity of simple labour. Experience shows that this reduction is constantly being made. A commodity may be the product of the most skilled labour, but its value, by equating it to the product of unskilled labour, represents a definite quantity of the latter alone. The different proportions in which different sorts of labour are reduced to unskilled labour as their standard are established by a social process that goes on behind the backs of the producers and consequently appears to be fixed by custom. This is from Capital. Cheng, talking about this, gives an example. He says, in the 1960s and 70s, an iron maker made a hoe and gave it to a farmer. The farmer did three days farm work for him, rather than pay him with currency. The people in the village all recognised that a hoe equals three days farm work. Why? Why did they not think that it was equal to four days work? Because they knew that the exchange was fair and acceptable. It's worth noting that Cheng worked in the countryside for several years during the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. But it's hardly an answer to say that the village knew that one hoe was equal to three days what, because they knew that one hoe equals three days. I mean, this is a circular argument he's giving. The problem for political economy is to uncover the underlying regularities that give rise to these exchange relations. Simply saying that it happens and that people think it fair doesn't explain much. Uh, Cheng and his co-authors go on to say, obviously extending slightly on what Marx said, the reduction of sim complex to simple labour is realised in the market. Before exchange, no one can calculate their labour complexity, since this is expressed in the exchange of products the other side offers. Therefore, all attempts to figure out a stable reduction rate or coefficient are methodologically in vain. 
In other words, he's saying it is the market that decides what complex labor is worth. But this is wrong. It makes sense for a very simple system like a smith in a village. It doesn't make sense when you apply it to a capitalist uh, economy. It's a reversion to explaining prices by prices by saying that value is determined by exchange, not by the conditions of production. And it's incoherent even in these terms. Consider the manufacture of a passenger jet. There will be a very large number of different types of skilled labour involved. Hundreds of different types of skilled labour are involved in producing a passenger jet. But you only have a single selling price for the jet. Okay, uh, A Boeing 737 sells for $51,000. Uh, a Comac C1919, which is the Chinese competitor, sells for $68,000. And it's impossible from this final figure to determine the relative value contribution of the hundreds of different types of skilled labour that are used in each of those planes. Mathematically speaking, it's an underdetermined problem. You would need at least as many different types of aircraft being made, each with a different combination of quantities of every different type of skilled labour as there were types of skilled labour to determine it. So if there were 200 types of skilled labour, you need 200 different types of aeroplane, each requiring different ratios of those skilled labours, if the market was going to be able to do this. And that doesn't happen. So the idea that the market can do it is just mathematically false. And Cheng's example is only plausible for simple economies like the Chinese village, where there is no collective labourer, where there are individual labourers but no collective labourer. So the alternative is to say, do wage differentials determine what is complex and what's skilled? But no, you can't take that in Marxist theory because wages are the price of labour power and can't be treated as a measure of the value created by labour. This was fundamental to Marx's analysis and Cheng, to his credit, agrees with this and says you can't use the wage levels as a measure of complexity. There's a different answer given by a variety of people, Hilferding in Germany in the early 20th century, the Chinese economist Zhu Zongdi um, in the early 21st century, and their solution was to look at the time taken to train complex labour. This is also what Alan Cottrell and I advocate in our publications. You've got to remember that product values in Marxian economics are labour multipliers. They tell you how much extra labour is on average required to produce one more unit of output of a product. And that labour can be direct or it can be indirect. Indirect labour includes the labour required to make means of production, but it also includes labour required to train the active workforce, and it includes equipment required to train the active workforce. When we say that complex labour counts as creating more value, what we're actually saying is that complex labour implies more labour being devoted to training. Now let's look at the labour that's devoted to training. What are its components? Well, in the first part, there's the time spent by the person being trained, doing learning, not productive work. Secondly, there are the time spent by their teachers. And thirdly, there's the labour cost of equipment and facilities used for training. In some cases that can be very considerable. If you consider the cost of training pilots, for example, the aircraft are very expensive. Cheng gives a hypothetical example of a skilled worker whose training 
costs 50,000 hours and who has a productive working life after that of 100,000 hours. Those are relatively long working hours, around 40 years at a maximum EU 48-hour working week it would be. If this worker requires 50,000 50, hours to train, he says then each hour of their time would count as one and a half hours of simple labour. Here's a diagram of it. This line here with 140,000 hours is the total working life of all people any person, whether skilled or unskilled. The skilled worker is only productive for 100,000 hours. The first 40,000 hours they spend training. In addition to that, there's indirect labour of others and equipment goes into the training. So that during their 100,000 hours of work, they contribute 1.5 hours for every hour they work. Now, if you look at this, there, there is an exact balance between the area here of extra labour they create through their training period and the extra value they create through having consumed educational means of production or means of education. But the important point is that there is a conservation relationship here. The total is the same in both cases. It's just distributed differently. If a society wants more skilled workers, it has to have a larger number of people undergoing training at any one time and it has to have a larger number of people carrying out the training. The labour multiplier sense of value enables you to sort this out. But when we come to pay, it doesn't imply that someone with an expensive training should be paid more. If training is free, and the trainee is paid whilst being trained, there is no reason why a skilled worker should get more than an unskilled worker or a less skilled worker. We can take an example from Britain today, which is obviously not a socialist economy, but in the armed forces it's operated on a non-commodity producing basis. It costs four million pounds to train an RAF pilot. They serve 12 years in a flying role. But a flight lieutenant is paid 42,000 a year, which is exactly the same as the equivalent rank in the army, a captain, whereas it only costs 110,000 to train an army captain. If the state trains you, it pays you whilst you're being trained, then you don't command a special price for your service, for your trained service. This is something that uh, may be restricted to the armed forces in a capitalist economy, but would be general or was general in a socialist economy. Thus, in the Soviet Union, doctors didn't earn more than people undergoing intense manual labour like miners.